talking about falls deep. I'm talking about falls deep. I'm talking about falls deep in love. I'm talking about falls deep. I'm talking about falls deep. I'm talking about falls deep in love. And now for our feature presentation. Balls deep. What's going on, guys? Welcome to episode 29 of Boz D uh, with Devin and Jovan. Obviously, by now, you know I'm Jovan. That's Devin. Um, to start off, before we before we even get into this episode, uh, we uh, we actually want to extend, uh, you know, want to say rest in peace um, to Tommy uh, Hall of Famer Tommy Hainson who worked for the Celtics in one form or another uh, from the day that he was drafted in 56 to the day that he passed at 86 uh, last week, um, making him the only person to be involved in all of all 17 of the Celtics championships. So um, dope, rest in dope. peace to Tommy Hainson. Um, condolences to him uh, or to his family. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, he's a legend. Um, so that's the start. Um, and to go on from there, um, we're going to start off today's episode with some MLB, and we're going to start that topic off with some history being made, uh, really big news, uh, made me very excited, very happy. Uh, I speak for Devin as well, when I because I know it made him very happy to see as well. Um, Miami Marlins named Kim, Eng. I don't, Kim Eng as their new general manager, making her the first female and first Asian American GM of any MLB team ever. Um, so, I mean, Devin, I mean, that's great news. How do you feel about it? It's amazing news. And yeah. you, you mentioned she's the first female in Asian American in MLB history, but she's also the first female general manager in four major North American sports, like the major leagues. Yeah. In um, in terms of North American sports, so this is a huge accomplishment not only for women um, and women in sports, but it's a great it's great to see because it seems like it was long overdue. Um, she has had like thirty years of experience uh, in terms of uh, being an executive um, in the sport of baseball, and it seems like she was due for this a long time ago. Um, just to put it into perspective, um, someone mentioned this to me and it kind of just blew my mind. Uh, but she had worked in MLB longer than Theo Epstein was alive when he was hired to be the Red Sox general manager. So that in its own just says a lot. Um, I know i seen some somewhere that she had... Um, it took her eight years to be an assistant GM in the MLB, but it took her tw uh, 22 years or somewhere in that range just to go from assistant GM to GM, which is, seems kind of ridiculous. And just because, you know, I know she's applied for multiple GM spots, but I'm just happy that the Marlins, you know, kind of broke that barrier, broke that glass ceiling, um, not only for her, but just women in general, not just women in sports. Um, just because now little girls growing up can see like if they want to be a GM in any sport or just be anything in life, it can be done. Um, so she seems to be a great role model for uh, little uh, girls around the world. Um, I'm happy that, you know, Derek Jeter and the Marlins pulled the trigger. Um, I just wishing her the best. Yeah, I agree. Um Obviously, it's unfortunate that it seems like, um, you know, women have to work, you know, so much harder just to kind of uh, make it somewhere in, you know, major league sports um, or in other positions in, in the world in general. Um, but, you know, it's exciting. It's great to see, um, like you said, over 30 years of experience as, you know, a baseball exec. Um, so, you know, she's way more than qualified. Um, she even's got, she even has a few rings from, you know, her stint, her stint with the Yankees. Um, and overall, it's just great to see. I know she's had, she said she, that she had a lot of, uh, a lot of interviews with a few teams and, it, um, it kind of, uh, 
left her not feeling well a lot of the times because she felt like sometimes she was just getting interviews to check the boxes of you know uh you know you know having a minority um and a female having applied and interviewed for it so sometimes she felt like she was just going into interviews for that reason alone um and half the time she was the most qualified candidate yeah. and she just was, wouldn't get it and she said it was, you know, sometimes very embarrassing that, you know, she had to go for these interviews and publicly obviously wasn't getting the job, especially being one of the most qualified persons. So, you know, just, you know, congratulations to her. I'm very happy that, you know, she finally got the opportunity, um, you know, to to lead, uh, you know, a baseball team at the highest executive position. And I mean, makes me that much happier that you know my favorite baseball player ever was the person to finally pull the trigger on that um and give her that opportunity it's icing on the cake respect <laughs> uh, uh with that being said yeah uh we're gonna move on to our next uh topic here robinson cano uh second baseman of the new york mets Suspended for 2021 season after testing positive for PEDs again. I don't know, man. Robbie used to be nasty. I don't know what happened. This this hurt me. This hurt me big time because he is my favorite player, current, like active player. Um, So he's my favorite active baseball player. And it, it hurt to see him go when he left the Yankees. And it's hurting me even more that in recent years he's dealt with this these kind of issues. Like he uh, he faced a eighty game suspension when he was on the Mariners. Then he gets traded to the Mets. No one wants to see that. Um, then his first season with the Mets, he didn't do all that great. And then in this past season, he just turned it around. He bounced back. He looked like he was going to be promising for that team moving forward. And boom, now he's banned for you know. The 2021 season, and it it not only hurts as being a fan of his, but being a fan of baseball. Um, I was giving him, you know, the benefit of the doubt after the first time, um, but it just seems like he's getting old, and he just seems to be reaching for uh, enhancements. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. Even after the first time, I mean, um. It was a little frustrating to see. I mean, he was always a 5 2 player, a great defender, uh, just as great on offense. So it just really didn't make sense for a player like him to have to go and even resort to PEDs, um, which kind of is always the case anyways. It's like you already have a promising career. You're already a great player. What are you really – what are you What are you doing? Um, kind of waste, waste the talent. Um it's just so fortunate to see, uh, especially because, like you said, he seemed to be turning it around. Uh, maybe that was due to PEDs. I don't know. But, I mean, he seemed to be turning it around. Um, the Mets uh, were starting to look promising. They're expected to make uh, possibly some big offseason moves, um, you know, to be in title contention. So, to lose a player like Robinson Cano, um, it sucks to be a Mets It sucks as a Mets fan or not. Me as a Mets fan, but if you're a Mets fan, it, it sucks. Uh, like you said, if you're a baseball fan, it sucks. Um, just in general, it's it, I don't know what he's doing. It's really unfortunate. It's definitely unfortunate. Um, hopefully, he turns things around. Um, but this just means that you know he forfeits his salary for the 2021 season, which I think was north of 20 million. So. Um, and I know he had two years left on his contract currently. I don't know if that means is after the suspension or includes the suspension. So that means he only has one season after he returns. Um, okay. That's not good for someone who's, you know, on the back end of their career. So hopefully he can turn things around, turn his life around where he doesn't have the results in this kind of stuff. Because I would like for him to, you know, end his career on good terms and not, you know, be known to someone who... Well, he's going to be known as a player who used PEDs, but, you know, someone – I don't want him to be known as someone who resulted uh, or relied on PEDs because he he hasn't used PEDs in his entire career. So uh, you just hate to see it. Definitely. Um, and to move on to our final uh, Major League Baseball topic, 
of episode 29. Uh, some M- some you know MLB awards for the 2020 season, 60 game season. Uh, MVP uh, Jose Abreu of the AL, uh, first Chicago Sox player to win the award since Frank Thomas in 1994, who actually went back to back. Um, he had a 317 batting average, 19 home runs, 60 RBIs, met, uh, led the MLB in RBIs. Uh, and National League MVP uh, Braves' Freddie Freeman, uh, first player to win the award since Chipper Jones for the Braves. Um, 341 batting average, 13 home runs, 53 RBIs in the 60-game season. Uh, both, you know, spectacular seasons for both players. Um, I was happy to see, you know... Um, Two kind of dark horses win it. I mean, you know, there are always obvious candidates to win it throughout the season. Um, but, I mean, not to say that either of them, you know, aren't expected, but definitely uh, not usually at the top of that list of players you think of. Um, but, you know, hats off to them. They both had great seasons. Two big boys won the MVP, uh, first baseman. Uh, so, as someone who played baseball formerly, um, I was a first baseman at one point in my uh baseball career so uh shout out to the big boys <laughs> um and the Cy Young Award winners Indians Shane Bieber wins AL Cy Young Award first unanimous winner since Verlander in 2011 um and Reds Trevor Bauer wins NL Cy Young Award um and these are actually the first former teammates to ever win the Cy Young Award in the same season um so uh, I thought that was a pretty uh I thought that was a pretty cool um you know statistic there so, so you got two first basemen win the mvp and two former uh teammates win the cy young and one of those teammates is on the move because he's a free agent and is highly doubtful that he stays so um this should be interesting um i was actually happy because none of these guys ex- were expected to win the award prior to the season and like you said they were dark horses so kudos to all of them uh congratulations uh just you know Keep it up, and hopefully you can uh, secure another one in the near future. Yeah, it was a great season by both of them. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're going to be right back after this break with uh, more balls deep. We're going to be talking about some NFL, some uh, pretty big news in the NFL. We're going to be talking about after the break. It's your boy. <clears throat> Eat that pussy 445. I want all you motherfuckers to go fuck with my motherfucking main niggas, um, Devin and Joven, over there at the Balls Deep Podcast, my nigga. You feel me? If you guys don't know them, um, you guys will know them. And if you guys are hating motherfuckers, you guys can go suck a mean ass fucking dick. You know what I mean? Um, Balls Deep with Devin and Joven. They know their fucking shit. Um, they're funny as fuck. They are, without a shadow of a doubt, the best sports podcast on the fucking planet, my nigga. You feel me? So go check them out all over social media. They're all over Apple Music. Wherever you guys get your guys' motherfucking podcasts from, Balls Deep with Jevin, with Devin and Joven, go fuck with them, nigga. And if you guys don't fuck with them, drink my fucking piss, bitch. We're back with some more Balls Deep. Um... We got a couple topics to talk about in regards to football and uh, specifically the NFL. Um, but we're going to, you know, go talk about a topic that we already touched on when it first, you know, broke the news. But um, it, it seems to um, be wrapped up and finished with. So the DeAndre Baker situation, um, in, we know that, you know, he was facing charges in terms of armed robbery. Um, those charges have been dropped. Um, officially, the lawyer of the alleged victims from uh, the case now uh, is facing uh, extortion charges. So William Dean, um, the lawyer uh, for three of the four victims of the armed robbery, wanted Baker, quote unquote, wanted Baker to pay each of his clients more than 266000 And in, ex- um, in exchange, the victims would either stop cooperating with the prosecutors or change their initial sworn statements to police. Um, the sheriff's office also alleges that Dean told Baker, uh, Baker's attorney, that his clients would do anything you want so long as the money is right. Uh, so DeAndre Baker's lawyer initially said that you know he was trying, he was being extorted, and he was really the victim in the situation, and no one was you know believed him. 
and it came out that he was right, and they were trying to extort the guy for money. I'm I was a huge DeAndre Baker fan prior uh, to him hitting the NFL due to him playing at Georgia and playing big time. Then the Giants drafted him. I was hoping for great news, and as we said in prior episodes, I was wishing him the best and hope that you know he was exonerated for these charges, which he is. So I'm happy for him. Uh, it's pretty sad what this world ha- has come to, and I'm not talking about uh, being innocent till proven guilty. It's really, you know, you're guilty till proven innocent. But what I'm talking about is these people almost ruined this, this man's life. And that was to, you know, just get money out of him. And it's pretty sad how low people kind of stoop, but it is what it is. It's over. He's he's a free man. He's no longer a member of the Giants because the Giants released him. But he he did sign to the Kansas City Chiefs uh, practice squad, and he soon soon as he's up to speed with the playbook and everything like that, uh, he'll be elevated to the active roster. So um, I I think that's a great place for him to be under Andy Reid and you know former Giant uh, Steve Spagnola. Uh, I think. Steve Spagnola uh, will, you know, he'll he'll help him reach his potential and maximize his potential. His potential, but hey, the the kid might get a ring, his first or his second year in the league. Now that he's on the Chiefs, so it's a great opportunity for him to win and prove himself. So I wish him the best from here on out. It just sucks that you know it didn't work with the Giants, but he's got his life back. So that's all that matters. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um. I mean, you and I said in the in the previous episode where we covered this uh, a few months back, um, you know, to give him the benefit of the doubt, um, it should be innocent until proven guilty. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, he was innocent. Um, it's an unfortunate situation. Uh, but like you said, I mean, I mean, it's all over now. But it does suck because he's already lost money. He's already lost time in the league. Um, I mean, who knows? what the difference is between, you know, all that time missed. But, I mean, we'll see. Um, I mean, you know, as soon as he's up to speed on the Chiefs, he'll be elevated to the to the active squad, like you said. So, um, you know, I, I hope I hope the best for him. You know, um, I hope he, you know, does well in the league um, and can, you know, kind of recoup in terms of all the time lost. Um, and you just, you just hate to see it. I mean, you know, people really – do anything they can to make a quick buck, um, you know, not caring at all about, you know, the person's life that they ruined. Um, but, you know, it's a good thing to see that they're going to get what's coming to them, uh, hopefully, um, and he gets to move on with his life. Um, like I said, I wish him the best. This almost seems like it could be a 30 for 30. Probably will be in the, in the future um, just because how much chaos has happened. Um, in this short timeline, you can say it's only been a few months and all this has happened. So, um, hey, it could be a future 30 for 30 a documentary on what's going on because the kid's life almost got ruined and it's pretty sad. But like we both said, we wish him the best. Um, the Chiefs really need, needed uh, corners. They need really need help on that defense. So hopefully he can, you know, reach his potential and help them out because he – to be honest, he might end up being the cornerback one <clears throat> by the end of it. Uh, and with that, we're going to move on to some more Giants news. So today, news broke that the Giants have fired their offensive line coach, Mark Colombo. And to me, when the news dropped, I was confused. I was like, why? Why would they fire him? Like, yes, the offensive line has been terrible in terms of season long. But in the past couple of weeks, last few weeks, the offensive line has improved. Um, but from my knowledge, from what I've the research that I've done, um, it's it's improved because the last couple of weeks, Joe Judge has made it a focus to go and help out with the offensive line. Uh, he's went, made sure that they work on their technique, and as a result, we've seen an improved offensive line where. You know, they're able to run the ball and it opens up the passing game and 
resulted in two wins. So that was good. But now that they're in their bye week, I guess Joe Judge called Colombo into his office um, and told him that, you know, they wanted to bring aboard a consultant for the offensive line, I guess you can say, um, and a longtime NFL assistant, Dave uh, De Gugli- I can't even pronounce his name, Dave De Gugliamo. Um He's been big time. He worked for the Patriots. He worked for the Giants in the past. Um, recently, I know he's known for, you know, building that offensive line in Indianapolis or at least coaching them up to where they are now. Um, and he was he was in conversation. He was in the conversation to become the Giants head uh, offensive line coach in the offseason. But they decided and resulted to Colombo because of his um, experience with Garrett in Dallas which I thought was still a good signing, but they wanted to bring him aboard to consult the offensive line. And I think it's so Joe Judge doesn't necessarily have to focus on them each week. Um, but Colombo didn't take the news lightly. He was pretty pissed. He felt like he was being undermined and probably felt like his job was, he was going to lose his job eventually. Um, so they got in a huge arg- argument. There was rumors that there was a fist fight, but Giants reporters said that that was false. But it all resulted in Joe Judge firing Mark Colombo on the spot. And now they're Dave du- uh, Guglielmo, who was coming in to consult the offensive line, is now the offensive line coach. So it's crazy how all this worked out. I'll let you t- talk about it since uh, I've been here talking away. Um, I mean, I mean, really, I've. I mean, we got to see the results really to to be able to judge uh, what happened here. Um, it was kind of uh, surprising news to me. Uh, like you said, I mean, the offensive line hasn't been good, but at the same time, we really haven't had anybody on that offensive line. Um, uh, so it was a surprise, and I didn't really know uh, much of that news. O- only that there was some kind of, um, you know, you know, some some kind of fight or something between the two. Uh, that's really the only thing that I had saw uh, thus far. Um, but ultimately, I mean, it's good to see that the Giants, um, you know, are trying to solve those, you know, offensive line woes uh, because we do have Andrew Thomas, who really wasn't showing much uh, promise or, you know, uh, wasn't getting really progressing at all throughout the season up until, like you said, the last few weeks uh, where the offensive line had looked, had looked great. Um, so, May, like you said, I mean, once Joe Judge took over, um, is obviously when they started to look good, and that's probably when the Giants realized they needed to move on or they needed to get some help in terms of coaching that offensive line. Uh, even Will Hernandez, who we drafted last year. Um, no, we drafted him. With I mean, I'm sorry. Saquon. I um, think two years ago. Sorry, sorry. Um, Will Hernandez, who we drafted two years ago, uh, really hasn't progressed much himself as a guard. Um, so. You know, now that we've replaced the offensive line coach um, with somebody who is, you know, a longtime uh, assistant on in the NFL, um, hopefully it pans out. Hopefully we see, you know, a lot more progression, um, especially, like I said, th- like I named those two players right there, those two really young guys who can be the core of, you know, that future offensive line, uh, who have a lot of ceiling, a lot of potential. Uh, hopefully we see a lot faster, a lot better progression now that we've, uh, replaced an offensive line coach who really hasn't, you know, produced anything for us in the last while, you know. <laughs> uh, so for me, I've been hard on Andrew Thomas as well. Coming out of college, I said he was the best tackle in the draft, which I still stand by that statement because coming in terms of your college resume, he, out of all the top uh, tackles, he had the best resume. And it just seems like what's hurt him in the NFL has been um, his technique. Um, but I don't full fledged. I haven't, I'm not putting all the fucking blame on him. And the reason why I'm saying that is people forget who he's playing next to. He's playing next to Will Hernandez, who, since, like you said, since being in the league, has looked terrible. And mainly, he's looked terrible in, I should say, let me correct myself. He has looked terrible in his pass protection and not really 
his he thrives in the run game, and even then in run blocking he has struggled. So I think that's why coming into the season they wanted Solder to play next to Will Hernandez and have Thomas play next to Zeitler, which would have made more sense um, because these past few weeks or past couple weeks now that Shane Lemieux has t- taken over uh, the left guard spot for Will Hernandez, Andrew Thomas ha- has looked night and day. Not saying he didn't he hasn't struggled, but he's just looked there's a lot to his performance and there have been cons. So that's why I'm not putting the, all the blame on that. But with uh this new offensive line coach, his experience in terms of developing talent, um hopefully it'll help develop these young players and you know, Andrew Thomas, Shane Lemieux, um, Warren Hernandez, Matt Pert. Um there's some upside to this offensive line. Uh it's just a matter of maximizing the potential. Uh, and last thing that I was going to say, um, is I guess the, these young players weren't, you know, reacting or taking, uh, Columbus coaching or, or whatever. They weren't responding in the correct manner, uh, taking it in as they should. So it was right for judge to, you know, bring in help. He, he probably felt like, He's not wasting his time, but he could, you know, allocate his time to other groups that need his help. And he didn't want it to be a, a constant thing where he's helping the offensive line only. And, um, so that's why he wanted to bring in a consultant. I understand where Colombo is coming from in terms of feeling undermined, but at the same time, is like, come on, dude. Yeah. You could you you could use the help, and uh, and I, I think he should have just for at least the rest of the season see how it worked out. There's it's only a few, it's what, seven weeks left in the season. Um, he could have, you know, see how it worked out in terms of working with this consultant. Um, and if he didn't like it, he could have stepped down at the end of the season. But in the end, he was pissed off about it, and he lost his job. And there's not much more to say about it. Yeah, and, like, I mean, we have a very young offensive line, uh, especially that left side. Uh, like I said, with Andrew Thomas and Will Hernandez. But you also got to think uh, with, you know, the lack of production uh, from Andrew Thomas, you also have to realize the defenses that the Giants have played this year. I mean, the Steelers, who have the best defense in the NFL, uh, with a lot of premier pass rushers, uh, one namely T.J. Watt, the Bears, who have Khalil Mack, the 49ers, the Rams. I mean, Washington, who's, you know, bolstered up that defensive line, the Buccaneers. So, I mean, they faced really talented defensive lines or defenses, more specifically defensive lines this season with, you know, plenty of premier pass rushers uh, down that list of teams. So um, that also, you know, is a factor to put in there. But like you said, um, with all this time that he's had uh, to progress these players, more specifically Will Hernandez, who's been here the last two years and really hasn't produced um, you know, it's it was definitely a need for change, and hopefully we get that change. And now we're gonna shift over to the NBA. But before we we talk about the NBA, uh, we're gonna take a break, and we'll be back with more balls deep. Yo, what's up, everybody? King Triple C here, the Olympic champ, the flyweight champ, and the bantamweight champion of the world. In other words, the goat. The greatest of all time. Meh. That's right. Anyhow, I want to give a special shout out to Devin and Jovan. I know you guys have started your podcast, Balls Deep, with Devin and Jovan. I want to congratulate you guys. And I want to tell everybody that's out there that doesn't know about them. So you guys follow them. Subscribe to them. And you guys make sure to follow them on all your social media platforms. Because if you don't. You guys can bend and need a triple C. All right, we're back with more balls deep. Um, we're going to bring to you some NBA news. Since we last recorded, um, a lot of trades have been they, – they've happened. So <laughs> a lot of shit has happened since we last recorded and talked about the NBA. Um, and a lot of shit has just went – well, crazy since, you know, the NBA opened the gates for trades, and we're going to talk about it first. The first trade to break down is the Lakers have acquired Dennis Schroeder from the Thunder for the 28th pick in tonight's draft. Um, 
and Danny Green. But hold up, wait a minute now. Uh, we just found out Danny Green is not going to OKC. Um, we already knew that he was en route to another uh, third party team. Uh, the Thunder were looking for a trade partner, and they have found that trade partner. Um, they are trading him to the 76ers uh, in a trade package for, uh, centered around Al Horford. Uh, Jovan, do you want to, you know, mention the details? Um, so, Denny Green and Terrence Ferguson traded the 76ers for Al Horford, uh, 2025, first round, the 34th pick tonight, as well as rights to Vasilye Micic. Um, and that means the Thunder have three picks in the top 34 uh, in tonight's draft, uh, which and, is huge. Everybody's been talking about how many draft picks that the Thunder have in the next, you know. Yeah, they probably have, I think, like, I think they're inching closer to 20 uh, first-round picks. A lot of picks. And so uh, from now to 2026. So I, I'll, I'll talk about that more, you know, at the end of this segment, but uh, we'll talk a bit more about um, some other trades that went down. But before we go into any other trade, what do you think of that, that trade with the Lakers? I know I'm a huge fan of it. You had your doubts, but we'll let you speak a little bit about that. I mean, I don't have doubts. I know how good Dennis Schroeder is. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I also know what it means for, you know, Raja Rondo now. Um, he's not coming back to the Lakers. Um, and I mean, I get it. I'd, I'd much rather have Dennis Schroeder, um, you know, long term than Rajon Rondo. I mean, he's young. Uh, he's, you know, more reliable offensively at every level. Um, but there's just things that Rondo gives you, uh, more specifically when it comes to playoff time, uh, that you cannot replace. Uh, he's an on-court, you know, on-court coach, um, you know, a, a, an amazing, probably one of the best passers I've ever seen. Um, you know, one of my favorite point guards ever. Uh, you know, the hustle that he gives on the defensive side of the ball. Um, he's really just, he's very, how do I put this? He's very annoying, uh, at least for offensive uh, offensive players. He's uh, a pest. He's, yeah, he's a pest on, on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, um, like I said, the, the hustle he gives, the tenacity he gives, uh, his basketball IQ, um, the leadership, it's just, it can't, it really can't be replaced. Um, and so, like I said, moving forward, it's really going to be missed to not have that, you know, kind of player on your roster, uh, especially if he, uh, there was rumors that apparently he might try to go to the Clippers now, um, especially if we, end, we could possibly end up facing, uh, you know, later on in the season and come playoff time, uh, Rajon Rondo is a difference maker. Uh, because in my opinion, yeah. unlike Patrick Beverly, he actually plays defense. Um, so, I don't know. I Like I said, uh, I love uh, shorter. I love it long term. But short term, obviously, I'm just going to miss that leadership, tenacity, hustle from, from Rajon Rondo. Um, that's really the only problem I did have with this trade. So I like the trade. A lot of people compared uh, Shorter to Rondo when he coming out of you know the draft. That's his uh, draft comparison or his pro comparison, I should say. Um, so I think he, in terms of shooting, there's a lot more upside to that. We've seen what shooting, what Rondo shooting meant to the Lakers come playoff time. So if we're gonna have that on a consistent basis now, um, I think that it's gonna be beneficial to us. He gives us another playmaker uh, or ball handler that we could use. I guess LeBron's been fond of him and his game for a while now, so the fact that they went out and got him is good. But they ultimately made the move because they had their doubts about Ronald leaving in free agency, and that th those doubts seem to be coming true. Um, the Hawks seem to be wanting to offer him $15 million, a contract for $15 million, I think, for two years. So... But he doesn't seem to be as interested in that. He wants to sign with the Clippers for a mid-level exception. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not saying that um, I hate Rondo, but if he goes to the Clippers, I cannot root for him. Uh, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, but I'm definitely m more of a fan of his now that you know he was a member of the Lakers and a, a member of the championship squad. But hopefully, he doesn't go to the Clippers. Don't don't go to the Clippers. But now, speaking of. Um, the rest of the trade, 
Um, I think it was a good move for the Thunder. It gives them another draft asset. They seem to be rebuilding, um, you know, planning for the future. Now, they do get Al Horford's contract, which also means Steven Adams is gone. Um, but I think that was inevitable, uh, inevitable with them trading, you know, CP3, which we'll talk about next, and um, Schroeder. And then, um, but I don't know what that means for him because he's older. He's just probably going to be a leader in that locker room for a younger team. But for the Sixers, it's more of unloading their contract um, with Al Horford by taking in Danny Green, which they do need shooting. So if he can shoot like he's supposed to, I guess that'll be a good move for them. But the way he was playing for the Lakers, that ain't happened. That ain't happened. So, and the Thunder got more draft assets with um, what's coming from the Sixers. So Sam Presti, he's doing his thing. He's doing his thing. He's doing his thing. Yeah, um, I I like I like the Al Horford um, I like Al Horford uh moving to the, I'm sorry the Thunder um it's a really good move for them um, we spoke about how many picks the Thunder have um and if you want a, a locker room leader um Al Horford is the perfect guy uh, especially if he stays long term with all those you know all the draft capital they're gonna acquire and. And all, all the players, all the young guys they're going to have coming in and already have on their roster. Um, it, it seems like a, a good spot for him right now. Um, he looked really good last year in the playoffs, so I, I don't hate the move. And then talking about another Thunder move. So the Suns have acquired Chris Paul from the Thunder to pair with De, uh, Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton. So the details to the trade, uh, the, the deal sends Chris Paul and Abdel Nader to the Suns for Kelly Oubre, Ricky Rubio, uh, Ty Jerome, Jalen uh, Lekic, uh, and uh, 2022 first round pick. So I do think the Suns kind of gave up too much for Chris Paul, um, but it was a it, I think it was the right move. So yes, they gave up a lot, but it was more of a desperation move. They've been looking for a player. Uh, of Chris Paul's skill set to, you know, pair with Devin Booker, and I think it's going to be a match made in heaven. I think he's going to maximize DeAndre Ayton's potential uh, with, you know, the pick-and-roll situation, but Devin Booker, is he's got some pressure lifted off his shoulder now that he doesn't have to play every single role on that team. His job just got easier um, now that they brought Chris Paul along. If he can do or replicate anything that he just did for the Thunder this past season, uh, the Suns will be a playoff team, in my opinion. Um, now, uh, they, they did give up a lot, and the, main, the one thing that I think they give up that kind of hurts them is Kelly Oubre. I think he looked good. He was a bright spot on that team last year. But you got to you gotta give up something in order to get something that you need, and I think he's more replaceable in this situation um, than a player of – uh, like Chris Paul for the Suns, at least, but for the the Thunder, if you keep Kelly Oubre, that duo of uh, Shy Gilgers Alexander and Kelly Oubre, that's a that's a nice duo to build your franchise around for the future. And I think they'd be crazy to trade them, but I think that that moving forward, the Thunder seems to be sitting on um, a gold mine. Yeah, um, I, I I love this I love this trade for the Suns. Um, like you said, Booker, Chris Paul, match made in heaven. Um, you know, so much of the workload lifted off of Devin Booker's shoulders. Um, and initially when I saw this, I did think uh, same as you. I thought that they gave up too much. However, weighing you know. Although you did give up, you know, a very good talented player like Kelly Oubre amongst other pieces. Um, I think this elevates, you know, the Suns from like you you said they're a playoff team. I think this elevates them uh, from a team that was fighting for an A spot last year. I think this could elevate them to a five six seed, uh, maybe even possibly higher. I mean, Chris Paul is a game changer. Uh, we saw just how much better the Rockets got when he joined. I mean, they were already talented with James Harden. 
Uh, but as soon as Chris Ball got there, um, it almost seemed like they had a real shot at winning a title. Um, he was such a huge difference maker. We saw what he did in OKC um, last year, which was completely unexpected. Um, I mean, nobody really expected him to do anything last year. And here they were in the playoffs, um, you know, bringing a lot of good teams to six, seven games. So um, I think this is a huge move for the Suns. Yeah, they gave up a lot, but uh, they gave up a lot to gain really everything. I mean, this elevates them to a real, you know, a team that can really compete. I mean, um, they have a good trio in Aiton, Booker, and Chris Paul now. And really all you have to do now is fill in some, you know, decent average role players to kind of, you know, come in and just do what you need them to do. Um, you don't really need any spectacular talent. You just need guys to f- come in and know their role and, and do their role. And at this point, like I said, I think the Suns become a really good team. I mean, we saw the run that they made last year uh, in the bubble, winning that eight games. And I said, you know, hopefully they can uh, use that momentum to, you know, launch them into having a great season. Um, and now with this acquisition of Chris Paul, I mean, I think it's perfect for them. I'm I'm definitely I think I think the Suns are like obviously not including the Lakers. Um, the Suns are probably the most the team that I'm most excited uh, about seeing, like most excited to see um, next year. Um, I wanted them to you know do well in years past. I was hoping for them to turn things around, and they got Chris Paul. So there's no turning back now. So the only way up the only way is to go up. Uh, but I'm really excited to see uh, Chris Paul team with Booker. But what I'm more more excited about is him playing under Monty Williams again. We know he played under him in New Orleans at some point in his career. Um, and I think that experience and chemistry that they built throughout their career uh, or that time in New Orleans is going to it's gonna shift over to Phoenix and uh, Devin Booker who's one of my favorite players in the league, is going to be a uh, from that. Uh, but to shift over, uh, we got some more trades. Uh, the Bucks have acquired Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday from the Pelicans for Eric Bledsoe, George Hill, and three first-round picks. Um, there's also some pick swaps included in this deal. Um, I don't know what year, so I'm not going to you know sit here and tell you. But there's some pick swaps. Initially, I thought it was a great move for Drew Holiday. Um, for Drew Holiday going to the Bucks, I think it's an upgrade, and I think he's better than uh, Eric Bledsoe and George Hill. But I do think that they gave up a lot of picks for it. But like the Suns, it was a desperation move. They're trying their best to you know uh, try to maintain what they have, which is Giannis, and they don't want him to go. So. They they're not making this move unless Giannis approves of it, and I but I do think if Giannis does happen to walk away, uh, they're kind of they're they're kind of screwed um, with them being a small market team and giving up three uh, draft picks. But they also, in the same day, um, landed Bogdan uh, Bogdanovich from the Kings, um, along with Justin James in a sign and trade. Um, so the Bucks are trading Dante uh, Divincenzo. Uh, Ilya Sova and DJ Wilson to the, the Kings in the deal. Um, I think that was a great deal as well, um, requiring someone like Bogdan, who has massive potential, brings um, some shooting, who can stretch the floor. So on paper, their star lineup of Drew Holiday, Bogdan, Chris Middleton, Giannis, and Brook Lopez, it's kind of scary, but I think it's not a championship winning team. There's two, still question marks about that roster, but I think they, they'll make noise in the East because it's the East. But we just found out that the Bogdan uh, Bogdanovich trade is it's um being threatened at the moment. Uh, Javon, care to explain? Uh, apparently, the trade is in jeopardy due to Bogdan really not having agreed to join the Bucks. Um, so I think the Bucks are being kind of weary of that. And so now that trade isn't a guaranteed go, uh, which in my opinion is really unfortunate um, 
for the Bucks, uh, I felt they gave up. I mean, I love Drew Holiday. I think it's a huge upgrade uh, compared to, you know, Eric Bledsoe and you know, George Hill. But um, I think they gave up really a lot. And, I mean, like we said, the Suns did too, but they didn't get – they didn't get nearly as good with the acquisition that the Suns did. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of how much better they got with the player they acquired, I don't think they got as good as the Suns did. Um, and so for me, I think what made that trade more worth it is them having acquired uh, Bogdan and, you know, that sign and trade. So if that deal does fall through, uh, I think it's a really huge hit for the Bucks. Um, and I, I think ultimately they're just... I I think that they took a, a big loss if they if that trade if the second uh, trade doesn't go through ultimately I think it's bad um, and I don't think Giannis will be there for that much longer um, in general because I think but for me is like why is Bogdan not approving going to the Bucks you're going from the Kings who are one of the worst teams in the league to the Bucks, who are one of the best teams in the league, and you have a, cha- a opportunity to win a championship. So, yes, I know it's in Milwaukee, and you're going from California to Milwaukee, um, but it's like, what, do you want to stay on the Kings? Like, I, I, I don't understand why it's it, – this trade shouldn't be in jeopardy um, if it's depending on Bogdan. Now, if it's depending on other, other things, so be it, but – I think they can make it work. If they don't acquire Brogdon, I think they'll probably acquire someone like a Buddy Heald if the Kings are still willing to, you know, work out a trade. But I think Brogdon is a better fit for what they need moving forward. I mean, possibly, you know, I think with or without this trade, Giannis kind of already has a foot out the door, um, and he's waiting for the Bucks to make a big splash. I don't know that Drew Holiday is a big enough splash for him to want to stay. Um, and, I mean, maybe ultimately that's what – is really, you know, turning Bogdan off. Maybe the prospect of Giannis possibly leaving is what is turning Bogdan off from going to Milwaukee. Um, yeah, but the but the Bucks without Giannis are still a better team than the Kings. Hey, I would say <laughs> that they weren't. But I mean, ultimately we'll have to see how it plays out. Um, I I don't know. Like I said, I don't think with or without this trade going through, I don't think um, anything the Bucks have done thus far is big enough to really make Giannis want to stay. I mean, there's been rumors he's been wanting to, you know, be traded uh, or that he'll leave in free agency. So we'll see. I mean, we will see. We'll see if the Bucks try to do anything else. Like we said, the trade window is open. So, But I definitely think if they want to keep Giannis interested in staying a Milwaukee Buck, which he said he wants to for the rest of his career, but, you know, they obviously need to get him some help. I think they, they need to make a, a lot bigger splash. Um, than they have so far. But hey, at least the Bucks aren't the Houston Rockets now. <laughs> and that brings us to our next topic, Houston. We have yeah. a problem. So um, with everything going on, they made a trade. Okay. So they made a trade. Uh, they traded Robert Covington to the Blazers for Trevor Reza, a 2020 first-round pick. A 2021 protected first round pick. Um, this trade is going to become official after the draft because you can't trade consecutive uh, first round picks in terms of years. Um, so I believe the Rockets will, or the Blazers will be picking for the Rockets tonight in tonight's draft. Um, and then it'll become official once the player is drafted. Now, I think that was a good move just because. They need draft picks. They don't have any. And although I like him as a player, you're getting Trevor Reza back, who's almost – he's a 3 and D player as well. Um, and you're getting draft capital, which you didn't have already. But I'll let you talk about just that trade in general before we hop into everything else that's going on in Houston. But I think I think this was a win-win for, for both teams. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's – it's definitely a, a a good acquisition, but obviously getting getting the the picks um is huge um for the Blazers. Um they have, you know, pretty good talent over there um already. So acquiring those picks and potentially, you know, pairing a, a future um star 
with Dame and McCollum could be big for them. No, no, no. The Rockets got the picks. So the Blazers traded well, the picks to the Rockets. Well, the Rockets are going to need it uh, <laughs> because both Westbrook and Harden uh, are wanting out currently um, from Houston. So obviously um, the acquisition of the picks is going to be big for the Houston Rockets. Um, we'll have to see, obviously, how that transpires um, because you can never put a name to a pick until that happens. So yeah. um, the Rockets are obviously going to have to draft well um, because, like we said, uh, the possibility of losing both your star players um, immediately drops you from a uh, title contender to a bottom of the barrel team, especially in the West. Um, so the Rockets have a lot of problems right now. Not just a problem. They have a lot of problems right now. Yeah, so they're having a revolt, guys. Um, the players seem to revolt, uh, seem to be revolting. Um, for many reasons, I heard it was mainly because of the owner. Um, I guess he's a big-time Republican, and he was supporting the current president, and the players got word of it, and don't want to play for him anymore. But uh, the initial news that I heard was that they were they James, both James Harden and Russell Westbrook wanted Ty Lue as the next head coach of the Houston Rockets. When they didn't make that happen, they no longer they cut communication with the team. Uh, and the first communication between either and the team was Russell Westbrook informing them that he wants to be traded. Uh, he no longer wants to play in Houston and no longer wants to play with James Harden. He says they're still uh, close um, in terms of their friendship, but in terms of on the court, he doesn't want to play with them. And it's mainly because he wants a similar role to what he had in OKC where the ball's in his hand and he's the alpha. He doesn't want to take a back seat like he did this past season with James Harden. Um, and it makes sense, but you're not going to win a championship that way. Uh, you're not going to win a championship with Russell Westbrook as your number one player uh, just because he's not consistent enough, in my opinion. Uh, and I'm talking about shooting-wise. But it is what it is. That's him. It is what it is. But not only that, so the Clippers and the Knicks and the Hornets seem to have shown interest in Russell Westbrook. I hope he, I hope he goes to the Knicks. I think the Knicks needs someone of his caliber to, you know, recruit other players uh, to play. If not, the Hornets, with you know him being uh, endorsed by Jordan and Jordan being the owner of the Hornets, I think that could be a match made in heaven as well. But the surprise came when James Harden requested his trade. Um, so news broke that. He's pushing to go to the Brooklyn Nets to pair with KD and Kyrie. Um, I guess they've been working out in California together, all three of them. Um, so there's no surprise in that. But I heard that KD wants Harden to come to Brooklyn, but Kyrie does not. So I don't know how. It, I, I think if they do get Harden, um, I think the Nets are one of the the only teams that can offer um, the Rockets a big-time trade package, and the, re and the reason why I say one of, you're getting Spencer Dinwiddie, Jared Allen, um, and Karis LeVert, a package of those three. That's a really good package deal for uh, James Harden. I don't think that they'll get his – if they do trade him, I don't think that they will get his full worth. Do I think they should trade him? No. Um, I think – he has two years on his contract, force him to be there and kind of just build, try to build a championship team. He can't not play. That, that's not going to happen. Um, and also, his trade value is only going to spike the more he's with the Rockets. But the only teams I could see, you know, offering a better package than the Nets would probably be the Sixers, who can offer Ben Simmons, or the, the Celtics, who can offer a Jalen Brown, a Marcus Smart, a Kemba Walker, because they seem to be shopping Kemba. Um, so I think that would be a surprise team in landing James Harden. Um, I guess there was a verbal agreement um, with the Brooklyn Nets and the Houston Rockets. But I don't know how much truth there is to that. I think they have had conversations, but I don't really trust the verbal agreement aspect of it. 
Um, and I do think if he does get traded, he's not going to the Brooklyn Nets. That's my prediction. Um, I think the Celtics will be the surprise team to trade him or uh, trade for him and get him. But I think the better landing spot for him, if he goes anywhere outside of Houston, would be the 76ers. I would like to see him paired up with Embiid. Um, I think that would be very interesting. And But him going to the Brooklyn Nets, I, I don't think that makes them a championship squad. I think they'll make it to the championship as long as they're all healthy because of the, the superstar power. But I don't know if that puts them over the hump in terms of beating one of these Western Conference teams for a, a title in a series because you're going to have to trade pretty much the rest of your squad and your depth isn't going to be there. So we'll, we'll see. And there's there are three ball-dominant players, so yeah. who knows how that's going to work out. And I doubt Kyrie's going to want to be the third best player on this team. So I think the Brooklyn Nets are probably better off just sticking to the squad that they got. Yeah, I mean, Russell Westbrook... Uh... To speak on Russell Westbrook a little bit, I don't see Russell Westbrook getting a championship anyways in general. Um, it's hard to win a championship with a player like him uh, because he is a gunner, but mostly because he is an inconsistent gunner. Um, I just think that uh, obviously Russ wants the ball in his hands. I feel like uh, with him being the one you can win, uh, a lot of games with him being the one and having the ball in his hands, I mean, we all, are, are already saw it um, in OKC, but you're not going to win a championship with him being the number one and having the ball in his hands. With that being said, I know the Knicks would be a good destination for him, but I don't know that he would draw anybody to the Knicks. Um, I honestly feel like there are not many players left in the NBA, uh, or at least uh, star player, star caliber players that want to play with uh, a guy like Russell Westbrook, especially considering he wants to be the number one. Um, but I do think they give he gives them a better chance of landing another that, uh, high caliber player because a lot of them have been avoiding New York for many reasons that are known at the moment yeah. in terms of their owner. But I think bringing him in may recruit other players to come. I'm not saying that they will. I'm saying th they have a better chance. Of course. Well, of course, they have. They do have a better chance with Russell Westbrook. I don't think that they do end up recruiting anybody else. Because, like I said, one, I think, like you said, the big factor is nobody wants to play for James Dolan. I don't think they really get anybody uh, until he's gone. Uh, so that might even mean Westbrook doesn't go there um, unless he's traded. But, like I said, I don't know that there are many, you know, all-star caliber players that want to play with him. Um, and to go on from there... Um, Harden in Brooklyn, uh, as soon as I heard the news, um, you hear the star power and immediately, um, like, oh, my God. But when you really think about it, it doesn't feel like as much of a threat. I'm a lot more scared of just KD and Kyrie than now, now than I am KD, Kyrie, and Harden. Uh, there's really only one ball. We know, that, we know who's taking most of the shots there. It's KD. He's by far the best player of the three. Um, and like you said, I think... Immediately, the issue is Kyrie doesn't want to be third. He already is second fiddle to Kevin Durant, which I don't think he already cares to be. Um, we know he wasn't. He didn't like being it to LeBron. Um, so now I, having I, think, to, I think with Katie, his mindset is it's more 1A, 1B rather than A and B um, because they seem to be on the same you know level in terms of their, the way that they've been talking, the relationship, they seem to be on the same page. So I think he doesn't, in, right, currently he doesn't believe he's second fiddle, but I think with them possibly acquiring James Harden, he will know he's not only the second fiddle, but he's the third fiddle. And the reason why I say so is they have Mike D'Antoni on the coaching staff, and we know what he did um, with his offense in his entire career. He has one guy who is the you know the primary ball handler and the offense goes through he had steve nash in phoenix then when he went to houston who was that player james harden so if james harden were to go to the nets it's most likely going to be james harden again um and Kyrie's not going to want to sit there in the corner and be the chris bosh and kevin love of you know the prior the prior trios so he's going to want to have the ball in his hand and do what he does best oh well, yeah well 
uh, like I was saying, um, he he. He might view himself. He might view his situation currently different than it was with LeBron. Uh, but also, I mean, he had a great relationship with LeBron, uh, and then we saw what happened. Uh, I don't know where he just, for some reason, didn't want to be in the finals every year. Um, so I don't know that him and KD work out for very long. Um, but it'd be even a lot less time if Harden is there. I think the perfect scenario is uh, Philadelphia going and trading for him. I mean, we spoke in previous episodes about the prospect of bon, uh, Ben Simmons being traded. Uh, so this is a perfect opportunity to trade for him. I think the Sixers are stupid if they don't. Um, having Harden to pair with, uh, you know, uh, to pair with Joe Embiid immediately makes your team that much better uh, because I think the consistency in, in which, you know, Harden's able to score compared to Ben Simmons who can't shoot a three um, makes them vastly better. Uh, so I think, in, in my opinion, that's the ultimate spot I think Harden should want to be. But to talk about what you said, you don't know why he wanted to leave Cleveland and didn't want to be in the finals every year. I, I'm i actually in agreement with Kyrie in terms of how the situation was handled. Um, just because, I, from what I know, from the reports and articles I've read, he approach LeBron in terms of LeBron's future because LeBron I think was on those one year player option deals or the two year player option deals where it's basically he can opt in and he asked LeBron like do you plan on leaving do you plan on leaving and LeBron was kind of giving him the run around didn't really give him an answer so he took his future upon his own hands and requested a trade and then everything blew up when everything hit the media but he did it the right thing where he kind of uh kept things on the low and, you know, requested a trade and things like that. Um, and it was he was right because LeBron ended up leaving to the Lakers. But the way he handles himself in Boston, that's on, on that's that's another thing to speak about, which I'm not going to go into. But he's ultimately where he wants to be, which is Brooklyn um, with the Nets. He's a New Jersey kid, New Jersey native. We know the Nets come from New Jersey originally before going to Brooklyn. So... I think the the Nets would be better off not trading for James Harden, um, but it's kind of hard to resist it because he is James Harden. Yeah, now, 100%. Um, moving forward, we're done with this. Um, today is Tonight is draft night, and a lot of these young players have a bright future. My, my favorite player in the draft is Lamella Ball, um, and I really hope he lands somewhere uh right and um what are you look like what is a move that you are um looking forward to or you you want to happen whether that be a player getting drafted to a certain team or a trade that um could possibly break uh break out during the draft tonight trade in terms of draft night or just being no there? like a trade that happens tonight doesn't have to be in terms of it could be, let's say, a big time player getting traded to a different team just happens tonight. Like, what is oh, something that oh, you would well, want to happen? I, I did uh, speak a little bit on uh, Harden to f- the possibility of Harden going to Philadelphia uh, because I I honestly think that is the best move that could be made amongst any team. Like I said, um, the ability of Harden to score at ease uh, compared to Ben Simmons' lack of ability to score. Um, makes the 76ers that much better. Um, but with that being said, I really like to see uh, Lamella Ball on the Hornets, uh, more specifically because I heard uh, Jordan give him a stamp of approval. Um, I really like Lamella Ball. I think he's the best uh, all-around player of all three Ball brothers. And um, to play under you know Jordan's franchise and the possibility of you know having you know being under Jordan's wing. Uh, as, as such a talented player, I think would be uh, huge. I mean, obviously, just the meme factor of it alone is hilarious because his dad in the past said he could beat Michael Jordan one-on-one. Um, so now going and playing for Michael Jordan's franchise would be hilarious. Um, but like I said, I think he's a talented kid. Um, and, you know, gaining Jordan's stamp of approval is huge. Um, I'd love to see him in a Hornets uniform. So that actually brings me to the question that I had for you uh, this evening was 
that Jordan gave the stamp of approval for the Hornets to draft him if he falls to three. So if he gets drafted to the uh, the Hornets, do you think the one on one battle of Michael Jordan versus Bar <laughs> Ball happens? Uh, I don't. I don't know that Michael Jordan even entertains that. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't think Michael Jordan entertains that at all. I, I think Michael Jordan respects him as a father, but he probably just laughs it off. But I would like to see it happen just for, you know, shits and giggles. But I think if it does happen, it'll be uh, behind closed doors, almost like the Rocky Balboa, um, Apollo uh, Creed uh, fight, you know, that was behind closed doors, so no one really knows the winner. I think it'll come down to that, and LeVar Ball is going to talk the talk, and he'll make a, he'll make a show of him, make headlines of calling out Jordan for the 1v1. But I, I do think they have mutual respect for each other. So that would be yeah. interesting to see. But yeah, LeVar Ball ultimately will swear by it that he beat Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I love LeVar Ball. I've always been a fan of his. Um, You got to give him his respect for, you know, what he's – Doing yes, he's talking out his ass to some, but he's a great father, and his two of his sons went um are about to get drafted top five in their draft in their respective draft class. Now you do you did say that he's the most overall uh, ball brother, and I um Lavar Ball will agree with you as well. He's in the past said that Lamelo is a hybrid of Jello and Lonzo, so Lonzo is a facilitator uh, defender. Um, and, thing, and things like that. Jello is a shooter. He's a big body. And LaMelo, he's got that big body. He's got that six, seven frame at the moment. He could continue to keep growing, but he can shoot out the gym um, like Jello, and he can, you know, facilitate. His one question is defense, but that can be fixed, especially with his frame. Now, the trade that I would like to see, so I, the three locations I would like to see him play is the Knicks, um, the Knicks, the Pistons, and the team that I'm about to tell you that I think will trade for him tonight. Um, and that's the o- OKC Thunder. So I think they're going to, with all those picks that they got going on, I think they'll trade up and try to get uh, LaMelo to pair with uh, SGA. Um, and I think it'd be an interesting uh, move just because they have SGA already. But they did have... Uh, LiAngelo Ball on their um, G League team for some time at the end of last season, and he was technically on their practice squad in the bubble, um, I believe. So that could be their way of recruiting Lamelo and in kind of learning more, scouting him, but you know to build a relationship. We know Lavar Ball has talked in the past about having his three sons on a single team, and he just wants him to go to a team that will ultimately have all three players, all three brothers on one team. And if OKC already has Jello on the practice squad or G League squad, that's already, you know, an open door for Jello into the NBA. So now if you draft LaMelo, the only ball brother you got to go get is Lonzo, and he's probably going to be on the market soon, whether that be free agency or trading. Um, so I think that'd be one interesting move I'd like to see. But does it happen? We'll see. Now, another move that I would like to see um, actually has to do with, um, I forgot what I was going to talk about. Um, Well, shout out Manny. Happy birthday uh, to our guy Manny from, you know, the Expansion Pack podcast. Go check them out when you get the chance. Uh, if you're a gamer, that's probably the podcast for you. But the reason why I mentioned him, he's a Magic fan. We know before we recorded, he, we talked about RJ Hampton going to the Magic. He seems like he wants that move to happen. It's his birthday. Magic. Make it happen. <laughs> so that'd be another move I'd like to see. I think RJ Barrett, not RJ Barrett, RJ uh, Hampton didn't really showcase his talent as much as he would like in the in the um Australia for the NBL. But I think the Magic would be a location that could, you know, be beneficial. I think the Magic will actually trade up in the draft. They're currently drafting at fifteen. I think tonight they'll make some moves to probably unload some contracts and probably go up and get a player 
like RJ that they could be interested in. Um, he could probably fill the Terrence Ross role if, you know, they decide to move on from Terrence Ross. And I think the Magic are going to make some noise um, tonight because they're going to try to improve so that they're not fighting for a playoff spot next year. They're not going to be a seventh, eighth seed in the East. They're going to try to be, a, you know, four, five, six. Obviously, they're going to be aiming for, you know, the top spots, but realistically, they're going to be trying to go for four, five, six. And, um, they're going to have to get younger. They're going to have to get better. They can't continue with the same thing that they've been producing the last couple of seasons because that's the definition of insanity, man. You can't get the same results if you, um, you're, you're, well, you can't get different results if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. So, um, shout out Manny. Hopefully, the magic, you know, bring you a, a birthday gift. But that's all we have for you today. Make sure to go tune into the NBA draft tonight. When this uh, episode releases, you'll already know what the results of the draft. Um, but before we go, make sure to hit that follow button, the subscribe button, uh, hit the notification bell on the bottom. Um, and also tune into our weekly pick em. So by the time this episode drops, the pick em will drop the following day. Um, we, you know, we speak things into existence over here at Balls Deep. <laughs> so I say tune in. Uh, that's all I have to say. Besides, thank you for tuning in per usual. Jovan, anything on your end? I mean, just the same stuff, man. Just thanks for tuning in. Like, subscribe. Uh, hit that notification bell. The bottom. Um, <laughs> and like Devin said, uh, you know, go follow that expansion podcast. Um, you know, if you like gaming, if you don't, uh, they definitely talk about a lot. Uh, that could possibly, you know, pique your interest and get you into gaming. Um, they have a lot of good insight, uh, especially now with the new gen consoles coming out. They talk a little bit about that. Um, so you could learn a lot and you could, you know, find a new interest in gaming. They're funny. Um, so just show them some love. And that's it. And happy birthday, Manny. Uh, so that's that. That's all we have for you today. Uh, until next time. Peace. You're talking about balls deep. I'm talking about balls deep. We're talking about balls deep in love. I'm talking about balls deep. My boy's talking about balls deep. We're talking about balls deep in love.